Okay. All right, man. Episode five. My name is Dane, and we also have the lovely and beautiful Liz Charles joining us, and the next beautiful face that we are going to be seeing here for the first time is Jillian Scott Ward. I hope I got that right. Um, in Harlem right now, New York City, like literally in the base of where everything is taking place with COVID-19 right now. And this is a very special show for me because um, I firmly believe in having discussions on mental issues and just talking about your mental stability, period. So this is, this is going to be a wonderful show for me. It's going to be probably one of my favorite episodes because I really do enjoy talking about stuff like this, especially because as a man, I don't think this is spoken, spoken about a lot. So I've given the secret out. This is our topic today. It's mental, mental, mental illness, mental issues, uh, just talking mental period. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much, Jillian, for joining us on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. Perfect, man. And you're in Harlem right now, New York City. How are you feeling? That's the first thing I want to ask. How are you? You know, I, I'm taking it moment by moment. You know, that's the truth. Um, in this moment, I'm good. I'm feeling grounded. Uh, when I was getting ready, I took a shower and um, played some fun, upbeat music and was kind of dancing and um, you know, doing my mindfulness, letting the water run and feeling good and really focusing on, you know, right now in this moment, I'm safe, right? In my yeah. apartment, I'm with my family, uh, I'm safe. Um, but, you know, last night I was reading an article and I was flooded with emotions like anger at the administration and fear about what's gonna happen. Um, and, you know, like wondering when things were gonna go back to normal, even though I think the normal's gonna shift. Um, so, so truthfully, I'm, I'm, I'm the spectrum. And I think that uh, is a normal experience for people. Oh man. Yeah. You know, we were just talking about this offline, but I want to bring it up, you know, in a public setting. And, and of course, for us to be transparent to everyone, because when this first hit the island and the first hit the world for the first time, I was not concerned. I don't want to, I don't want to insult people that are losing people out there or, or that has been concerned and has been taken as serious. I just, my mind works that way. And I think it's because I'm a man that believes in prayer and believe in God. So I just believe that I have the ultimate gift, which is peace. But then a lot of times we're also human beings. So I wake up in the morning and I do feel like that peace has somewhat disappeared. That what That's ex exactly what makes me a human being. And the days of like just getting up and feeling like I can have my own private party or I can work out or I can just be entertained by what the kids are doing. And sometimes I join in with my kids and pretend like I'm a five-year-old too running around the house. Uh, but that ceased today. That stopped because um, I, I woke up to the reality of more people dying. That now the, the new love is staying away from my mom and and staying away from friends and family and and staying away from my best friend. That's the new love, and that doesn't feel right to me. And it affected me. Like it made me wonder, like what's going to happen? And I started to panic. I started to to question my existence here on Earth for the first time, and 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 that came in heavy. Um, you must deal with this a lot, um, Julian, because you, you probably speak to people and your, your job is to probably calm people down for thinking like this. I mean, what advice can you give to someone that's, that's been thinking this way? I, I just woke up to it. I've, I've been onto that rock, but what advice can you give to someone that's always been thinking this way? I think that we have to be compassionate with ourselves. Um, you know, what you're feeling is normal. What anyone is feeling is normal. You know, most people, who we're gonna interact with on a daily basis have never experienced a pandemic. You know, this is a global pandemic. Um, so there isn't really a playbook um, mm -hmm. as to how to get through this. Um, and none of us knows what this will look like in our communities um, a month from now, two months from now, a year from now. And so, um, of course that you're gonna have a lot of mixed feelings. Of course, it's gonna be difficult in some moments. Um, and so the best advice I can give people is really to understand that every day is gonna look different. Every moment's gonna look different. And we need to have compassion for ourselves and others in this time. Thank you so much for saying that, Jillian. Um, you know, one of the things that has been keeping me 
awake. One of the things that's like in my thought process constantly, even as I go outside today, I went for a walk today and the way that we're all, you know, consciously trying to keep away from each other. Um, and that is what is this new normal going to look like? You're a clinical psychologist. You are able to have conversations with people where you're getting into their heads and into their psyche and understanding people's hearts. I'm, this is going to shift. I think this, is, can you talk about how this is going to shift us as a culture in general in reframing this new normal? Right. I mean, I think that we can think about it in multiple ways. You know, one way that things are going to shift is that we will all begin to realize that we're a global community. Mm -hmm. um, I think that some cultures are better able to understand how we're all interconnected um, and much better at what happens to my neighbors happening to me. Um, you know, that's kind of like how I grew up in my smaller community, but certainly in, you know, a larger sense, growing up in New York, um, you know, it's really like every individual for himself or for herself. And um, I can turn on TV and I can see what's happening in Italy and it doesn't really affect me like that's them. It's never going to happen to me. Uh, but now I think that we all need to come to understand that what's happening to my neighbor is happening to me. My neighbor doesn't have health insurance. That impacts me. I want my neighbor to have health insurance. My health insurance, my, my neighbor doesn't have food. That's not great. That's going to impact me. And so hopefully it can help us move to uh, a more compassionate connected standpoint where we're making decisions individually and we're making decisions um, legislatively that understand that. Sam, what, what do you, thanks, hey, Rico is with us. What up, Rico? Hey, Rico. Yeah. <laughs> hi, hi, guys. Sorry about that. Hi, Julia. Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, man. Hey, I don't want to get you in any problems, but I, you know, I always have to ask the real question and what people are thinking. I got to put myself in a headspace a lot of times like what do you what do you think the, the United States could have done differently to avoid the numbers that they're seeing right now because I in, in my heart I felt like something different could have been done yeah everything could have been done differently you know a few months before um this all happened uh, you know the pandemic response team uh was disbanded um, you know, there was an entire pandemic outline of what to do if something happened that was created under the Obama administration. That was not followed. Um, so I think that basically our government could have done things a lot differently. And there were people who were prepared to handle this and they were fired because frankly, our president was so wrapped up in his own experience of wanting to be better than Obama and destroy everything that Obama created, you know, now we as a country are in this, uh, in this predicament, right? We, you know, we were one of the richest countries in the world. Um, there's absolutely no reason why we should have the, the numbers of deaths that we're seeing right now. You know what, you know what shocks me? And I want to give somebody a chance to ask a question, but it just hit my, hit me just a couple of minutes ago, like when you were talking, um, what hits me is that I think what the United, and I can only speak as, a, as someone that's watching from a bird eye view. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't vote in the United States. I don't have any privilege to do that. Uh, but I can look from a different perspective and see things. And, you know, I've always been told that when you get into business, especially as a business owner, or if you're going to run a major corporation, you kind of have to have no emotions. And I kind of felt like that's what the American people did. They picked someone with no emotions. And let me tell you what I can be detrimental to any business or the, to, to the ultimate business in running a country is that you have to have some form of emotions because from the get go, I kind of felt like this was not taken serious. This is something that was like, that's just a word. That's something that the Democrat has made up to, to, to put us off track and, and put us off the real issue, which is make me the president for the next four years. But here we are not having someone that won't, come out and say, let me visit families and, and not to say get close to them, but let me show how, how sorry I am for this, the mistake I've made, because the mistake has already been made, but I don't see anything to clean it up. I don't see anything to show compassion. I don't see anything to see that people are dying and this is hurting people. Like today for the first time, you know, my wife is telling me that she lost a friend that she knew in high school. 
So this is hitting close to home now. And you're getting more and more upset because you're like, okay, so the leader of the free world is not showing emotions about this. How are we supposed to act? Because that's, in some ways, whether you like to believe it or not, we get our mental stability from, from them. Like someone yeah. that runs the country, like if you're not, if you're not taking it serious, how are we supposed to act here? Dane, I just want to really quickly, because you said it was not enough emotions, and I actually think it might be the opposite in the sense that okay. I think it's what you're picking up on is a lack of empathy, not yes. a lack of emotion, yes. because yes. if the emotion is concentrated only towards himself as opposed to others, then you get the problem. Yes, definitely. Sorry about that. That's, that's exactly what I meant. Thank you, Liz. So what, what do you think, Joy? I completely agree with Liz. I think that most people have a lot of emotions and the problem comes in when we don't acknowledge those emotions, right? Because then we begin to act outside of our own awareness. So, you know, I have never met the man. I don't know the man. We don't diagnose people we've never met. Um, but I think that he has a lot of emotion and a lot of it is a, a deep sense of inadequacy. Um, I think that he feels very small and I think that he does a lot of things to try to not feel that way. Um, and then this is where, you know, this is why we're in this position. I think that he saw Obama and who is the antithesis, right? Yeah. He's polished. He reads, um, you know, he got into school, pro you know, on his own merit. Um, uh, people liked him. Um, and for somebody who has the opposite experience, it's upset and he's black. <laughs> like, 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 let's, let's put that out there and he's black. And so he shouldn't have those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because I think that, you know, a lot of people are taught, not all of them, but a lot of people are taught that uh, your whiteness makes you better, simply your whiteness. And then to have someone who has the audacity to, you know, feel good about himself and, um, you know, have leadership skills and have intelligence, I think that's threatening for a lot of people. And so you're seeing that backlash, which is I'm not gonna think logically about like, you know, the importance of the pandemic response team. Like I can't even go there. I'm so caught up in my feelings of inadequacy, just kind of like, screw it. And, you know, we get further and further and further into the repercussions of that and there's no going back. Yeah. There's no yeah. going back because then you would have to own up to what led to that decision. And that's way too threatening for somebody who can't manage their emotions. Oh man, that's so true. I, I, like well said, um, well said. Um, Rico, do you have any, any questions? I know you just joined. And yes, maybe... yes, <clears throat> for sure. Um, my question is definitely to Jillian. Um, you know, there's so many people right now that has lost, obviously lost their jobs and a lot of people are going through this depression right now where they're feeling uncertain about everything. What could we really do as a community to really, you know, help those people, not financially, but how could we sort of help them to get out of this sort of negative um, bubble that they're in right now? Mm -hmm. It's a really scary time because there is so much uncertainty. Um, and, you know, what, what are the answers to when there's uncertainty? I think to help people feel like they're thought of, you know, if, if you can make a phone call, let them know that you're thinking about them. Um, if you don't have a lot to give, even like a meal, um, dropping off a meal and, you know, keeping your, your social distance, but letting people know that there's still a community. Um, definitely making sure you're advocating the lawmakers to put in, um, structures in place that can help our neighbors you know in new york city uh we definitely we now have a program in the beginning it was for students could go and pick up a bag breakfast or lunch every day at the school and a lot of advocacy work went into doing that um, and now because of the work of advocates adults can go three times a day to pick up breakfast lunch and dinner um, because we have to make sure that our neighbors, our family, our friends, our communities are taken care of. So, you know, how are you all um, engaging with your lawmakers? You know, I don't know exactly what's going on there uh, or what the structure is, but do you have uh, supports like that? Um, yes, we, we do have a support system that's 
coming together in place. There's not really anything that's for sure yet, but we do have something that I think the government is working on. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely government's working on something. It felt at first, um, I think, you know, I saw this, I think some of us probably even posted it. Um, at first it was very much individual based, like people being like, hey, if you need some help, be sure to reach out to me. I'm happy to help you. And I think all of those things were very well intentioned, but you can't scale that. And um, in addition to the fact that you can't scale it, there's also all of the like personal implications of people coming forward and the way that that might make them feel that makes it difficult so that um, it might not be as effective uh, in the long run. So it, it does feel like it's the kind of thing that has to live under government. And since we already have bodies set up in government that are like, like NAU, like et cetera, that are meant to take care of people in need, it's just a matter of mobilizing those units and ha having them figure out how they're going to work in this new system, getting that transition period worked out. Absolutely. And Julian, like really quick, man, I know that we always lived in a world where people were just always being depressed for any given reason, especially if they lost a job, might be going through relationship problems or they're in a creative industry and they don't feel like they're good enough to maintain that industry or they're just like not pleasing their audience. Um, this is a different time for us now. A lot of people are definitely losing their jobs. A lot of people are, are not around their families or not even around some somebody significant like a fiance they were supposed to marry very soon and how is how important is it now for someone to seek help to call someone and how can they do it um because i've recently just found out i've been living under a rock that i can actually do sessions one-on-one -on -one online i never knew that before and i found that alternative and you know i've been exploring that and it's been wonderful i i speak about that i echo that to so many men that it's so important mm -hmm. to seek help and can you just elaborate on that because there's probably a guy right now that's listening and be like i will never pour out my feelings to anyone mm -hmm. the only thing that's going to get us through this is to be connected with other people yeah um we can't go at it alone i think that this situation has taught us just that how connected we all are. You know, one person, you know, in China is connected to one random person in Harlem. We are all um, really, really connected. Um, and I, I think that the most heartening thing I've seen in the last 10 years of practicing um, clinical psychology is how many more men are engaging. Um, and allowing themselves to feel feelings. And I think that um, m men and women are really talking a lot more about how to reimagine what masculinity is, what it means yes. to be a man. And I'm yep. so excited to see men realize that actually having an emotional life is a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, within romantic relationships, within relationships with each other, uh, and that life is just much more exciting and fulfilling when we allow ourselves to have an emotional life, um, when we allow ourselves to have intimacy. And I think that could be really scary for some people if you're raised in a home or an environment where um, expressing yourself was looked down upon or even punished. Um, but I think it takes a lot of courage to open up and to be vulnerable. Um, but I really see that shifting um, with men, you know, half my practice is men now. Yeah. That, that do happened. you think that that's something, oh, sorry, sorry, Dean. Um, no, do you think that's something to do with like social media? Because I know, I, and I can't say this for myself, um, but <clears throat> I'm sure like people probably thought like, especially men um, to not really show their emotions. But I'm thinking like as, social media started like taking off or like, you know, you'll see it more in movies or different um, Netflix series that guys are being more emotional in that. We tend to feel like, okay, well, if that guy is being emotional, then maybe it's just not me who feels that way that I can actually express myself. Um, whereas before, I think maybe back in the day, people were a lot more sheltered in terms of, especially men in terms of showing their emotion. And, and now we're seeing that sort of take off. Do you think that's something to do with 
just the times that we're in right now or? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, seeing different images on television, seeing um, different uh, movements uh, through social media, I think really has given men permission to embody their whole humanity. Because when we cut off parts of ourselves, we're cutting off our humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great sentence. Um, I love that. When I, I think about Cayman, it's a small island. And so the availability of mental health providers isn't expansive, right? It's pretty limited. And I mean, I think as the mental health uh, buyers, consumers, uh, patients grows, the industry grows, there is that dichotomy of people not only looking for providers, but maybe looking for providers specific to their culture who might identify with them, whether, you know, in terms of race or gender or any, or creed or whatever the case may be. Can you talk about the movement towards telehealth and the way that you think that that might um, increase people's options to be able to get the providers and get the help that they need? Yeah, I can definitely talk about, um, the options. I mean, the, the great thing about what's happening right now with telehealth is that it, previously we've had a lot of restrictions in terms of you had to be in a jurisdiction. You know, psychologists, social workers, therapists, we're all licensed by a body. Um, so in the United States, every state licenses us and we can only see people uh, within that jurisdiction. Um, now, because of what's happening uh, with COVID-19, lots of states are relaxing those. You know, I submitted, you know, a one-page document, and now I can have, I have a temporary license to see people in New Jersey, right? And so um, that obviously increases the availability for people in New Jersey who are looking for a therapist like myself. So I'm not sure what the um, rules are in Cayman, but um, definitely uh, telehealth, depending on your jurisdiction now, really enables people to find and connect with people who might not be physically located closer to them. Oh, wonderful. That's good. I hope you can, I hope you have something like that here. I'm not sure, Rico or Liz, if you guys I feel like that's that. something, that's an area where we can probably lobby the government, right? Yeah. That's where we yeah. would make movements towards that in the legislation to allow for that. Especially sure. now, man, like, you know, Precisely. Like in this time, like I, without naming any names, but just recently I was, I was talking to someone and you know, our time's also running short guys. So I'm going to make this very quick, but um, I was recently talking to someone who's lost their job, man. It's affecting their marriage right now. And I had to go over to the house and, and you know, kind of speak to him about it. And he was, he kept on saying like, everybody thinks that I'm no good. Like, you know, she keeps saying that I'm no good. And you know, I, I had a conversation with his wife beforehand and I'm, she never said that. And, yeah. you know, after the conversation ended, I kind of said, man, why do you keep saying your wife say that you're no good? Like, I, I know you're special. You just lost the job because it's in the tourism industry. Like, I know you're special. This is just a crucial, this is a crucial time for the world right now. Things are happening completely different. I can lose my job. You know, that doesn't make me worthless. You know, I'm still a great guy. I'm still a great dad. I'm still a good husband. Um, but then I came to find out that people in his life, like his mom and his dad, always told him he was no good. So I said, you're not talking to your, you're not talking to your wife, mm -hmm. you're talking to your mom and your dad. I hope you know that. Like you're, you're referring to them when you talk to them. So that's why the, I think the last thing we said, guys, in one of our, in our episodes, I keep telling people, you really, this is not a joke. You really have to identify who you are because people will define that for you. Okay? And, and, and if you don't know who you are, then that triggers, that will keep, you will keep believing who you are. That's why it's important for me to speak life into my kids. I, I love mm -hmm. Khaled for that. Like, let's name somebody simple. Khaled always tells his kid, I love you, Asad. You are the greatest in the world. Daddy thinks you're the best. And I think once we keep doing that, it's like a, it's like we're depositing into our kids. Like going to a bank, you're depositing mm -hmm. money into your child. You're not withdrawing. I hate mm -hmm. doing that. I don't like to take from people. I like to deposit cash into people. And I think that's important. So I know, Jillian, you spend a lifetime <laughs> kind of doing that, correct? Yeah, I mean, that's so important. And I think when we're talking about masculinity um, and, and how that's changed, I think that people, particularly, yeah, men and women need to understand 
how really rigid norms about masculinity hurts everyone. And one 100%. of the ways it hurts men is by saying that, you know, your worth is dependent on how much money you make and what your job is and how you can provide, you know, financially with people. And it's like, men are not objects. <laughs> like, men are whole people, um, you know, with, with feelings and who could contribute other than just like how much cash. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's crazy. That's objectifying men just the way women don't want to be objectified um, as objects. So that's, so that's one. Uh, I agree with you. You know, the things that you say to your kids become their inner voice. Um, and so during this time, I think it's really important. This is why I stress mindfulness and being present um, is to understand what are the things that you're saying to yourself the most. Are you saying, you know, um, I lost my job, so I'm worthless, or this is never going to end, or, you know, we're all going to die, like all these kinds of things, are they helping to, are they helpful, or are they fueling a stress response, which is not going to help you um, if, God forbid, you get the virus, and so making sure that we're really aware of um, how we're talking to ourselves, so that we are not causing a stress response in our bodies, I think that's really important. Um, but also, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention is, okay, say there aren't a lot of therapists or, you know, you don't have a job right now, so you can't afford, um, therapy. Well, what well, one you could do is you can, you know, use a free hour of Zoom, uh, once a week at a very specific time of week where you're getting together a group of people and you're just doing group yep. amongst yourselves. How are you going to do a check-in? Um, you know, that kind of consistency, that kind of virtual community, I think is really important. It's completely free. Um, you don't, you know, you don't need to find a provider if your community doesn't have that or you don't have the money. Um, so don't feel, you know, hopeless if, you know, you don't have access to traditional therapy. Now, if you do, that's wonderful. And I do hope people will engage therapists. But if you don't, like all hope is not lost. Amen. Love that. That's wonderful. Uh, that's that's some accountability partners. Find someone you can speak to. Find someone that's strong. Um, even if someone that can just say ins inspirational words to you and just remind you how powerful you are. Now, with five minutes left on the program and the show, uh, Jillian, I want to say thank you so much for being a part of the show. You were a wonderful addition. You were remarkable. And I also just want you to give a chance, like even if it's one minute or less, just to tell people, what are you working on now? Because I know you're being creative in the background. And when this whole thing is done, COVID-19, what is your plans? And how can people reach out to you? So uh, I'm still practicing therapy here in New York and New Jersey. People can find information uh, about me at bodysoulpsych.com, B-O-D-Y-S-O-U-L-P-S-Y-C-H.com. Um, and I'm also a filmmaker. My film, Back to Natural, about the global natural hair movement is on Amazon streaming. Uh, so people can stream that globally, you can get a DVD. Um, you know, before all of COVID, I was traveling around the US working with legislators, making sure that people were able to present as themselves at work legally. Um, and so I do hope to re-engage with that once, once uh, this is over. Man, I love watching um, black, black women hold the world by their trope, man. Give her a round of applause. That's amazing. I'm proud of you. Um, any any other questions, guys? We got four minutes left. Anything you wanna you wanna leave with? Or that was pretty much oh, like she said everything, and you guys said everything. I think there is one thing I wanna I wanna note, and that is it is my understanding that the government has set up a mental health hotline, and so I do think that people should take advantage of that locally. Um, as much as you can. And I love Jillian's suggestion of just making group happen. I am so in. Definitely do that. Please find people you can connect with. Zoom is free and you can talk to people. You know, it's social distancing, but not on this platform. You can still meet up and link up with people, especially positive people. Uh, can we take a picture of this beautiful moment, please, before we I end the show? You. So we're gonna do a screenshot. Thank <laughs> you.